tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kata. I'm Dr Pat Tui, I'm the chair of this final session of the day on the first thousand days or the, the window of opportunity for long-term health. And we've got some excellent speakers to um, inform and, and entertain you for the last session of the day. I look at this as being a bit of a paradigm shift in child health. We've had 20 years of research, and longer actually, on the developmental origins of health and disease. And the new science around epigenetics has um, provided quite a lot of information about the how the early years affects the long-term life course. Long-term conditions, or chronic disease in adulthood, is one of the big challenges for the health sector ahead of us. And it seems to me as though paediatricians, at long last, are going to be playing a very important role in the long-term prevention of these sorts of conditions. And uh, uniting with our colleagues in adult medicine to address this particularly troublesome and intractable problem. And um, I'd say also at the end of this session, um, Associate Professor Mark Lane, the president of the college, will be uh, launching a, a position statement on the early years that uh, I've had the honour as chair of the Policy and Advocacy Committee of the uh, Child Health Division to develop. Uh, so uh, the copies will be available as you leave the, leave the theatre. After the three speakers, we will have a question and answer session and uh, I encourage you to put any questions through you have on the app and they will be uh, put up onto the screen and the, uh, the group, the, the three speakers, will be able to sit down and answer some of the questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Professor Richie Poulton. Richie's the director of the multi Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development um, Research Unit which has been undertaking the Dunedin Longitudinal Studies for several decades now. 2007, he established and became co-director of the National Centre for Life Course Research, which is based at the University of Otago in Dunedin, but partners with universities across New Zealand and internationally. He's held a number of positions as the inaugural Chief Science Advisor to the Ministry of Social Development, and uh, published in excess of 250 peer-reviewed papers in uh, a number of highly reputable journals. Uh, his areas of interest include mental health, nature, nurture, interplay, psychosocial determinants of chronic physical disease. In 2014, he was named as highly cited researcher by Thomson Reuters, one of only four New Zealanders so designated and was listed in the 2015 World's Most Influential Scientific Minds. So we're extremely honoured to have Richie with us to, here today, and I'd like to welcome to him to the podium. Thank you, Richie. The Dunedin Longitudinal Study has been going for over 40 years now. The study has grown in significance and impact Researchers all over the world analyse its growing mountain of data. Founder of the study, Dr Phil Silva, could scarcely have imagined the influence and importance the study would achieve when he launched it in 1972. Very proud of the, the legacy. I think that the publications and the output and the influences on policy and the fact that we've got the most documented sample of human beings large sample of human beings on the planet. That gives me a real uh, sense of pride. The study has published on average a new scientific paper every two weeks for four decades, and those papers are highly significant. If I had a list of the publications these world-class scientists and scholars have generated, I could probably go on for hours. It's probably the world's most successful longitudinal study of a general community sample, ever. It's an amazingly successful project, no question about it. 
If you calculate the impact factor of the Dunedin study, it's probably the highest of any study um, of the behavioral sciences, and it's creeping up there in the medical sciences as well. The study has made discoveries in virtually every area of human health and behavior, including gene by environment interactions that cause violence, depression and schizophrenia, measurements in childhood that predict health and wealth in adult life, how to spot future criminals in kindergarten, and why teenagers run off the rails. The Dunedin study is known in our field, in many fields, as just a, a hallmark and landmark study. I mean, just a brilliantly conceived study, and uh, whoever came up with the idea should be really thanked. I mean, this is a Nobel Prize winning study. So that's my talk. Thank you for coming. I presume it's going to switch into. There we are. Kia ora tato. Uh, forgive the hype. Uh, that's just uh, a simple way of introducing the study quickly. Uh, the hyperbole is a little bit embarrassing. And in, in, as well, Pat, some of those comments. So I, I've got to correct that information that gets sent out about me. Um, it's you know, over promise and at risk of under delivering. Um, my job today in 18 minutes is to give you a sense of what the science says about the importance of, well, the first thousand. Uh, I would want to stretch that, to be honest. I mean, it's a contrivance, the first thousand idea. It's, a, it's like a nice bumper bar. But of course, it's not just the first thousand. There's no scientific evidence saying that it. 1,001 days, the importance of brain development, physical development, emotional development uh, goes down a notch or two. Not the case, and that's what life course research tells you. Success begets success, and the reverse. So of course we're looking at conception through to, for convenience, around the preschool uh, point in the life course, at least I am. Uh, I'm going to present some data from two studies we've done, which identify uh, the importance of the early years in particular, going back as far as age three, which I think comes into the 1,000-day uh, envelope just, uh, and show that it predicts meaningfully what happens down the track. Otherwise, it would be of well, only academic interest, really. Uh, and I'll show that it predicts important life outcomes uh, not just in one particular area, but in multiple important life domains. And that that prediction withstands control for all the usual suspects. Distribution across social strata, cognitive uh, measures, IQ, and the like. It applies equally to men and women, and it just doesn't result from the extremes driving the association. So the first f study I'll focus on is about self-control. I'm going to have to crack through this at a hell of a rate. Um, please forgive me. Once I put the first slide up, you'll understand how to read the, the pictures thereafter, and I'll flick through quite quickly. I don't want to leave the stage before having talked about a follow-up study we did to, to test the 80-20 principle, the Pareto principle. This was made famous by Bill English. Uh, and social commentators, actually, we talked about seven Datsuns in the driveway uh, in New Zealand, meaning that people with multiple difficulties got attended to by different professional groups, and that seemed a bit crazy, and that maybe uh, fit-for-purpose teams should, should be addressing those people with multiple needs, multiple high needs. And we have the empirical data to show that that 80-20 principle does, in fact, apply. Beyond that, though, because at one level that's trivial, because everyone, in, at least in Wellington, when I have my science advisor hat on, would say, we already knew that. Uh, I'll show you some data that shows that we can predict that with quite strong um, uh, predictive associations from age three right through to uh, massive service use in the 20s, 30s, and well, late 30s in the case of this first paper. So, the Dunedin study, uh, a cohort of a thousand people, just over a thousand people. One important point to draw your attention to is that we've maintained uh, the cohort pretty much intact through time. 
that's important because the major threat to the validity of these types of projects is what is known as non-random loss to follow-up. The people that drift away aren't random. If only they were, you'd just start with a big number and let it whittle down. They're the people you most want to see. They're the ones that have the most difficulties. Multiple difficulties aggregate within the individuals that most cohort studies in the world have failed to follow up and um, re uh, re retain over time. So that gives us some confidence in our causal inferences. That's all I would say about that. I'm not trying to show off. It just strengthens what we believe uh, is the work that we produce. Just so you get a sense of the dynamic nature of the cohort, that's where everyone was. We've just finished phase 45 or age 45 assessment. We bring people from wherever they are in the world back to the Dunedin Research Unit. And the, the terrible slide, it was just done way too small, but I can tell you that 25% of our cohort live outside New Zealand. Only about a third still live in Dunedin after 45 years. First thing we're gonna look at is self-control. Why self, well, what is self-control? It's intuitively what you would think self-control is. Depending on your disciplinary background, you might call it impulse control, or executive function, or emotion regulation, or economists trying to dress up their rather common sense science, we'll call it intertemporal choice. Um, but we call it self-control, and it's about basically thinking before you act, about being able to delay gratification in pursuit of goals. Nothing esoteric about this. Uh, it's probably important uh, in the modern age, uh, where we've got really tempting um, distractions all around us, all the time. Uh, the first version of this self-control work was is the famous marshmallow study that came out of California, where children were placed in front of a marshmallow and the, the nasty experimenter left the room pretending to do something else and said, if in 10 minutes when I get back you haven't eaten that, you'll get a second one. And there's some lovely original footage on the web, which I recommend you look at, because these kids were delightful in trying to resist the urge to grab, grab the marshmallow and scoff it. And they go under the table, they bite their hands, uh, they cry, um, and they cry after grabbing the marshmallow and eating it. And I can tell you, I would have grabbed it as soon as the guy was out the door. Um, anyway, so it's probably a useful thing to study in this day and age. We um, use the composite measure, any particular measure at any particular time will have a built-in amount of error. If you composite via multiple measures from multiple sources, you reduce the overall error. Did this predict or variation on this measure in childhood, beginning at age three? And all the findings I present now are from the composite, but I can assure you that if you just use the age three measure from the first thousand days, three decades later, you can predict significantly the outcomes we're talking about, and the pattern is exactly the same. And I use the term pattern advisedly. That's what you need to take away from this first part of the talk. There's a certain type of pattern that occurs between your level of self-control as a child and whether you're going to do well in terms of here, physical health, as a grown-up. So we didn't just use a self-report measure of physical health or one particular domain of physical health. We combined multiple indicators of poor physical health. Of course, they're measured directly because we bring everyone back from wherever they are in the world and we measure them with the proper physiological testing uh, set up that you would uh, use in a uh, medical setting. We combined metabolic abnormalities, gum disease, STIs, and inflammatory markers as well as some FEV uh, measures. And what we found, and this is the pattern you need to look at, I'm watching the time, you need to look at the pattern and learn from this first slide, because it's going to repeat from this point on. What we did was divide our population, a general population sample, not selected, right? Generalizable back to the whole of the population. That's one of the strengths of the study. 91% of the births at, the, at Queen Mary Hospital were enrolled. The 9% who said, no, I don't want to borrow this study, didn't look any different in terms of social demographic factors and perinatal um, uh, data. So we've got quintiles along the bottom. Lowest quintile, lowest levels of self-control, next 20%, 60, 40 to 60, eight, 60 to 80, and the highest quintile of self-control. And what you see there is a lawful graded association. The lower your level of self-control during childhood, by the time you're 32, your likelihood of ending up in poor health, and that's what you see on this axis, is adult health and higher scores are worse health in this slide. 
highest level to the lowest level of self-control, then you've got a graded association. It drops down meaningfully in a lawful sort of way so that you see what you might expect if you were hypothesizing based on the extant literature. Those with the highest level of uh, self-control had the best health. What wasn't predicted, though, was this graded association. Anyone that's had the challenge of deciding between targeted and universal knows exactly what that graph presents you with, a conundrum. What about substance dependence as our next outcome? So we get that via the gold standard, structured diagnostic interview. We got a bunch of diagnoses for tobacco, so the illicit and the illicit, grouped it as one. Same pattern. Whether or not, and the red line is substance dependence index, combining all those things from the self-report of the study member. But we also went outside the study member because of error or potential bias and asked people that knew them well whether our study member had a problem using substances. And you see again a lawful relationship, highest rates of substance problems, lowest quintile of low self-control and a graded association down to the high level where it was lowest. What about wealth? These are things that governments are interested in. You may note this. We're trying to always be relevant. We've got to pay our master, which is HRC initially, because they fund us, um, but through the HRC we've got to pay off uh, the politicians and the officials as well. So we're trying to tilt our work uh, transparently to stuff that's relevant in that context. Um, we measured income and prestige and occupation, usual sort of stuff, same pattern. Income is the light blue, dark blue is socioeconomic status done in the traditional way. So lowest level of self-control, Lowest socioeconomic status, rising lawfully through time across the quintiles. What about just being planful about the future? And nothing esoteric here either. I mean, were these people saving? Uh, did they have um, a foot on the home ownership ladder? Did they start, had they thought about retirement or anything um, of that ilk? Well, again, it's graded, depending on what level of self-control you exhibited when you were a child. Struggles, self and informant report, same picture, struggling, can't eat, can't pay the rent, can't pay the bills. I'm racing, I know, but bear with me. Crime, what are, these are official stats, not just self-reported, so it's from the Australian and New Zealand jurisdiction. There we have not so much of a, a greater association. We've got a, a big dip from the lowest self-control quintile, but essentially it's still there. These are people that have gone for gone to jail for just criminal convictions, not necessarily just violence, but it's the same pattern if you talk about interpersonal crime, violence. Parenting, uh, this is about being a single parent, low self-control, surprise, surprise, you're going to be a solo parent. And we've also done a paper that shows that you start having children much younger than the rest of the cohort. And that's under review right now. What about... Uh, What's that say up there? Oh, the right type of parenting, you'd all know this, being paediatricians, warm, sensitive, stimulating, measured directly with the child and the study member parent at their own home when the firstborn child was age three. And we see a lawful relationship yet again. This seems to matter everywhere, and it follows the same graded association. What, oh, there's the control, so it applies whatever... Uh, point in the economic, socioeconomic distribution you look, it also applies um, to the extremes. It's for boys and girls, and it's not just driven by um, uh, clinical levels of um, uh, low self-control, ADHD. Economic measures. There's um, welfare benefit use, done in months. You can monetize that. So what do you see at the top? About 50 months between the age of 21 and 32, 11 years, the kids with the lowest level of self-control spent f the best part of four years, 50 months, on benefits. And they compare with those at the higher end of so childhood self-control who spent oh, 14, 15, 16 months. That's an appreciable difference. You're taken out of the workforce at that time where you're developing workforce skills. Right? You're laying down the basis of a career or, or a good job history, or not as the case may be. Um, people have looked at this data and they started to ask, okay, so these kids have got high self-control and it applies as early as age three. 
But are they just like over controlled? Um, are they so uptight they don't do anything in life except the right thing? Um, and so, and fair enough, and, but you know, just think about those outcomes we looked at. I mean, why would you not be happy if you stayed out of jail, you stayed off benefits, your health was good, you were a good parent, your kids liked you, you were planning for the future, you had some money in your pocket. And surprise, surprise, when we look at the, the data, yeah, there it is. Almost a straight line. Low self-control in childhood, lowest level of satisfaction by the uh, fourth decade of life. Okay. Now, looking at the level of self-control by age three and its precursors, because you're going to hear from Johan and Matera about what they may be, could, if you did the right thing from conception through to age three, materially impact upon these trajectories and reduce all these things which governments like. But I always think of this, this is you know, partly communication to the right audience, I think of this in terms of personal and family suffering and whānau suffering and toughness and low quality of life. You're going to have a meaningful impact upon that if you start early. And it's not a tenuous set of linkages to get there. Okay, what about the 80-20 rule? How am I going? Four minutes, good. So we did something interesting. So we've also got biorepository data and we've done a few um, papers on genes and environment and all that sort of stuff, which tends to excite a lot of nerdy scientists at least. Um, but I think one of the more innovative things we've done in recent times is to link our data to the national administrative data sets directly, not through the IDI, Integrated Data Infrastructure, which has just come on stream properly in the last handful of years. We've been doing this for about 20 years. So we were able to take our 1,000 study member cohort and quantify their use of services. And you can see them up there. You can read. I don't have to go through that. But when you look at the, the 1,000, which is a relatively small number, we're a boutique study, you can see the numbers begin to stack up. And we've chosen things that are, again, of interest to governments in terms of indicators of poor health. See Boyd sitting in the front row here, so there's a lot of fat there, excess kilograms of, of fat, and there's all the smokers and everything else. And we thought, let's have a look, see if this 80, parent, uh, 80 uh, 20 uh, principle applies. In other words, in each one of those areas, are about 20% of the population accounting for 80% of those figures? Yes, was the answer, in short. And here's just one example. What's this one? This is social benefits. So you can see that literally it was 20% of the sample who, equate, who, who accounted for a little over 80%, 81% of the months on benefits. Right? Now that really doesn't surprise too much. Seeing the numbers come in so beautifully was, was kind of nice. Um, they didn't always come in quite like that. But what we noticed was that these segments, be it kilograms, tobacco use, use of um, hospital beds, use of pharmaceutical preparations, uh, number of months on benefits, time in jail, they were not independent. There's a group that we could identify within the cohort, and it was 22% in number, percentage, proportion, and they accounted for 80% with some variation of those outcomes. When I talk about outcomes, we're talking three or more, multi heavy service users, we call them, right? So there's that bit in the middle there. These are people using multiple services, and we can identify that 80%, uh, sorry, that 20% that accounted for 80% roughly of that multiple service use. Now, I'm just about to finish. That's what it looked like. So there's some variation. Um, probably the last column, which your eye is going to more likely than not be drawn to, is ACC claims. That's accidents. So it's a mix of accidents uh, where you've got high risk behavior, but genuine accidents as well. But you see the top, around the top bands here, Pretty much the 80-20, dropping down a bit here. What is that one? My eyes are going, it's obesity. All right, so we could predict this group here. We could predict that group using multiple measures obtained between birth and age 11 from multiple sources, but no government has that information available to them. So this is where it gets very interesting and exciting. Uh, we went back to a simple age... Um, three, 45-minute interview. 
Pediatricians played a role here. We group it under the term brain health. All right? So it's five scores. It's a neurology exam, short neurology exam, basically some measurements of both fine and gross motor ability, the ability to understand and to express language, and that measure of self-control. Now that coupled together, composite together, explained with great strength compared to most data ever published before, over three plus decades, the relationship between being in that group that used all those services and that 40, simple 45 minute interview. Anyone that understands rock curves knows that a score of 0.8 is bloody impressive over, over a short period of time. That means 80% of the time you can predict with, you can accurately predict whether a person is going to be in your risk group and not in your in risk group. Sensitivity and specificity. Now, where this early determinants work has always run into trouble is that the relationships have not been that strong. All right, they're statistically significant, but they're not that strong. And that's made people hesitate on churning, throwing a whole bunch of money into the early life course, including politicians. But once you segment your population into those with recognized risk factors, which then account meaningful for overuse of services down the track, you get very, very strong prediction. If I had a magic wand, in fact, if I was a very effective science advisor, I would um, persuade the government that this is one of the things they should be doing at age three. Um, I could only dream of being that effective. Today, the point is to show you that within the first th thousand days, you can begin to meaningfully uh, predict how people's lives are going to turn out in multiple important life domains. That's some of the science. It's just two examples from our study. There are many, many other studies that converge on this basic point. Thank you. I'll hand over to one of my colleagues.